so many of my um, dear friends from many different times in my life who are all assembled here. It's very, um, it's very moving and daunting, <laughs> but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, since I already mentioned a dream, it, I was fumbling around and I found this interesting dream because I already had written this really rather fascinating take on, on my work as he, he says that, um, I don't know if you got a chance to read it, but he says that poetry and prayer are not the same, but they have this interesting tension or resonance. I think, I think that's probably correct. I, I, I'm sure it's correct. Um, so I, I found this, I stumbled on this dream that I had. So I thought I'll start with this dream. It's not really a poem, but um, in the dream, um, I was in a meeting with with my beloved wife, Moira Crone, who's a fiction writer and painter. And um, I realized that um, so much of me was in her books because we influence each other. And I realized that the one who authored the book gets the credit, but that was okay because there was something of me in her books. At that moment, a young and beautiful black woman with short cropped hair asked me to walk with her. She was very radiant. We walked a long way and came to an old tan truck and she told me to get inside. Uh, and she turned to me and said, I don't think you should be afraid to make everything you say a prayer. It was, um, it was a very moving and powerful moment for me in that dream. So also, I don't think you should be afraid is very important <laughs> because I think we are a little afraid to make everything we say um, a prayer, uh, something from the heart, something significant. So I thought I would start uh, with a few of the poems from 1976. Uh, I was explaining uh, to Ari before we started that this book uh, has had three incarnations or Gilgul Elim, um, if you want to say it in Jewish. The, um, and the first was in 79, when I first started writing them in 1976. Uh, actually, the time I met Moira. And um, the the second came, it was a very slim volume, 64 pages. And the second um, came out in 1991 from Time Being Books. And this third one, 30 more years worth of poems um, since then. So. It's it's quite a bit fatter and and I think organized differently from the original, but it does contain within it these different versions of itself. So I'm going to start with the first line and the first poem, the first couple poems from the book, which I wrote so long ago. And it's kind of moving for me to revisit that now. The invisible is stronger than the visible. The desert subtracted so many objects, there was nothing left but the wind. Like all good ideas, God was stolen. The Jews, being superior thieves, removed all the markings. The history of my family is the history of breezes. And the exodus, the getaway, my grandfather's, one carrying a barber pole, the other a tailor's needle. Um, I wrote this poem in a long sheet of paper like they used to have. I think I got it from the AP or something, and I just rolled it through the typewriter and kept typing. Uh, I wish we could still do that. Um, Jews do not come from heaven. They come from Russia with green eyes and olive skin. Jews do not go to heaven. They go to Baltimore. They do not come from heaven because heaven is always in the back of their minds. They don't want to think about heaven anymore. It's too much trouble. So um, a really around the time I was writing this book, a couple of different things were happening. And one of them was um, my friend Mark Lieberman gave me a copy of what's called the Rodkinson Talmud, which is a Talmud translated by a heretical guy into Victorian English. I didn't know any of that at the time, but it's actually I had never I was a Reformed Jew. I'd never seen the Talmud. I didn't know anything about it. And at that time in my life, it was so amazing just to read it, read it, and in this uh, way poets read, which is not for, I wasn't trying to learn the law. I was trying to get the sound of the voices, which in some way, since my grandfather had died a couple of years before, I was kind of hearing through the filter of Victorian English slash Talmudic Aramaic, my grandfather's voice. I, 
I believed it, and it sounded like this. So this is based on a real uh, passage in Talmud. Um, uh, at least the first two lines are. So it's called Pilpul, which I learned later was an example of a Sanskrit loan word in Hebrew. It literally means pepper. But in, in the within the context, it, it refers to one of these sort of um, where you challenge the teacher with a crazy question and try to get him to uh, bring out the logic to, to resolve it. So, Pilpul. Rabbi, if a child is born with two heads, which head should wear the yarmulke? On which head the tefillin? Some say the right head and some say the left, all quote Torah. Some say both heads, just in case. But if a man is born with two heads, he's always confused. On which He never knows on which head to wear the yarmulke. Two heads and only two eyes. He walks towards himself in the old cemetery where the rabbis are buried. There seems to be some disagreement. Some are saying, we are dead. Others, we are alive. Some say both. All quote Torah. I'm going to move forward. I'm going to jump around in time and it really doesn't matter in some ways. But um, a can guy. I, can I ask um, you a quick question before we go to the next poem? Yes, sir. So, and people, you can feel free to check questions as we go along. The first question is um, Is your is this book um, organized chronologically or thematically? This this updated book of poetry that we're talking about. The answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> basically, um, I kept the first volume, this 1979 small press volume, dry press volume, intact in the beginning. Although I added a few poems that I'd left out from that time, I kept pretty much the next version intact. And then the rest is thematic and not necessarily uh, more or less chronological within each section. So there's a section on mourning. There's a section on the Jewish calendar. There's a section on prayer and psalm and, and so on. So, And then uh, another question about the book. And we talked about before this program, but I wanted to bring it up in this context with everybody listening. Why not just have three separate volumes of poetry? Why, why do you keep updating the same book, The Missing Jew? Well, I do have three separate volumes. People bought them at different times. They all exist. So people feel free to buy any of the three they want. But um, I feel it as a life project. I, I've always felt it that way. And so I've always sought the opportunity to um, um, group the poems so that they would speak to each other and resonate and and could be read together um so and i was fortunate that um larry Udelson of uh, ben yehuda press was willing to uh, undertake that and uh, i should mention julia Nablach, who was the editor and really helped me uh, last year when we were kind of figuring out how to what to keep and what to throw out and how to organize it so i had a lot of help in the final of the trilogy of questions before we get back to the poetry um who is the missing jew yeah so um i'm not i i i why don't we ask that later and see what other okay. people think? yeah okay fine everybody that's a great question um we will yeah. get input yeah. from the from our audience well we have some wonderful audience here i'm sure they'll figure it out better than me um oh hey lance <laughs> amazing okay since so someone's um, a guy of uh, some magazine sent me an email with the following question how do you market prayers which kind of astonished me and the only thing i could do is write this poem does your prayer cross the street or is it like the skin of the serpent scratched against a stick or sharp stone does your prayer shred has your prayer ever heard a man cry or touched a woman's fur? No prayer for the smashed teeth of Ai Weiwei held against his will? I saw your prayer lying feeble in a book, and it could not climb to my lips. Your prayer has been in your pocket too long to care for the shape of a mouth. I have been in your prayers a long time, lying in the hospice 
staring at the telephone. I have been in your prayers waiting for the simple touch of your tongue. So um, while we're on the subject of prayer, and again, I, I just felt prompted by Ari to kind of find a way to select through what I might read. Um, this is a poem for um, a man um, who's generally known as the Baal Shem Tov, who's generally seen as the founder of the, of the Hasidic movement in um, late uh, 18th century, early 19th century um, Europe, especially in um, Ukraine. And um, he was the great grandfather of Rabbi Nachman of Bratislav, who, uh, whose Zion or tomb I visited in 2008 and wrote about a bit. But this is a poem for him, and it, it I, I guess just to be clear, he, he, he's called the master of the good name, but there were a lot of people who were called Baal Shem, which actually means master of the name, and referred to people who made amulets, and so you could be healed, or you could have children, and you'd hang them up, and and they had the the name of God as a kind of a magical uh, implement. But he was called the master of the good name to distinguish him from some of these other guys. Probably some of them were not the most legit. So he's known as a Baal Shem Tov. And uh, he's a wonderful teacher about prayer. Many of you may probably know about him directly or through the writings of Martin Buber. Um, so there's a poem for him. The master of the good name who only lived for prayer, trembled by the holy ark because a name so pure was more than a body could bear. The master of the good name saw each word in his prayer as another Noah's ark of wings, wild cries, and tusks that he entered in his fear. Said the master of the good name, the good name that can't be spoken, every word is broken a wave against black rock whose lacy fingers cannot hold. If it's only a human grammar that a name can ever name, every word is a death that falls away to nothing, which is no good name. So, um, I wanted to read a poem about my own name. Um, so I, I'm Roger in, in English, uh, but I was given a Hebrew name uh, after my, my, my mother's grandfather, who was known as Frank Kaplan, but his, his Hebrew name was Raphael. And so that's my Hebrew name. And um, Raphael literally means is a name for an angel and literally means healed by God, um, which I think is relevant. Um, there's some... Um, that's probably enough. Um, I bear Raphael is the title. I bear the marks of exile in my name when I become the silent Jew who mourns not for the temple or Jerusalem, but a stream in the hills of Ein Gedi. How dry the stream is there without my mouth, unseen the hawk who floats without my eye. They do not miss me there as I miss me, resting my bones here in a foreign bed, nor do they know my name is Roger there. They only know me by my secret name, the healing angel caused behind the wall I pass through in the dream of coming home. So um, this one kind of fell in with another one, which also, I suppose, touches on exile, which is a big question uh, for me and perhaps for some of you. Um, and um, it's, it's from Psalm uh, 137, uh, you know, if I forget thee, O Jerusalem. Um, and the title is Forget Thee. There were cities undreamed of when we forgot what we were yearning for in all those long centuries of exile. Cities with names and strange alphabets that became familiar to the tongue, 
Cochin, Shanghai, Rio de Janeiro, crowded cities without tear-stained prayer books, cities where new dreams scrape the clouds, cities with palms no psalm ever praised. Yet I turn back to you with my withered hand. Um, so I had a teacher, I had a number of teachers in my life, and um, one of the most important ones for me was uh, Rabbi Zalman Schachter Shalomi, uh, who's a founder of Jewish Renewal, who made this extraordinary escape from Europe uh, as a young man, a teenager uh, in the midst of World War II and uh, made his way to, uh, actually to Brooklyn uh, and was involved with Chabad. And then later, um, after a lot of exposure to various things, including LSD, became one of the leaders of Jewish renewal. And I met him in the story that I tell in The Jew and the Lotus on the way there. Uh, I met him in an airport, uh, leaned against um, one of the stanchions, and he was, this is the first time I saw him, he looked kind of like Matisse. He had a, a grayish beard, and he had a beret. He was leaning against a stanchion in the JFK airport. I sat down next to him and looked over my shoulder. He was translating the Buddhist text, the Dhammapada, into Hebrew. So I thought that was a good start. We hit it off, and uh, he became one of my most important teachers. And... Um, one time he was teaching me about um, this idea of um, the Jewish idea of reincarnation, of Gilgal, of souls being sent down into bodies, uh, which is part of um, Hasidic thought. And um, he told me this story about um, the fact that there's this angel called Dumia, which is the angel of silence, and that um, this angel teaches you uh, while you're in the womb, uh, the Torah, of course. Um, I, maybe you can request Shakespeare. I don't know, but apparently it teaches Torah. And um, then when you're born, touches you on the lip like this. And that's why you have this little philtrum on your lip and drives all the teaching out of your head, which is very puzzling. Although Reb Zalman explained it to me, but I'm not going to explain it to you unless you're curious. But I'd like to read the poem for him uh, because he spoke, first spoke to me about this angel whose name is Silence. When I was in the womb learning the Torah of the womb, Torah of threads of light, verses of the building bone, cell by cell, blood streamed, nerve by nerve, the angel taught me the Torah of night and day. I had no understanding, no tongue. The angel was patient as silence. Is there a Sabbath in the wound? In the womb, there is not even a year. But the angel, she and he, male and female, created me it. I had no breath. The angel taught me vows. My lungs slept quiet as flatfish at sea bottom. Eyes stirred in an unbuilt lids. In the other womb of the dream, I slept and woke, sleeping in waking, waking in sleep. I lived and loved 40 years and 40 days in the telling. My heart broke, healed, and broke again in the desert, the mountains, on the verge of a promised land. Then the world was created, begun before beginning. She and he created he them, and the angel created me, me. The flood came, and I rushed and never knew. The Torah of three months untaught me, which I would learn. The Avram of Abraham, the Sarai of Sarah. Torah of three months untaught, that I must learn in actual breath. And as I cried with first air and inhuman light and the presence of the dead, my mother lying in the blood and scream of the actual hour, the angel pressed his finger to my lip and left her fingerprint there and drove all Torah from my brain and left me baffled, cold and still. First erasure, blankness, 
dumb, I rushed into the unwritten world. So, um, I'd like to read the poem, another poem. This, this is, um, that last one is somewhere in the middle of all this, and this one's more recent. Um, um, and I guess it touches on this idea of the unwritten world. Uh, you know, Rilke speaks of the, um, um, the uninterpreted world, which uh, unfortunately we're incapable of living in the uninterpreted world. Uh, so animals pity us. That's what Rilke says in the elegies. Um, so this poem is called The Illustrated Book of God. I guess it's about my sense of what I found. I mean, I don't know why. I, I, you know, my friend Alan is here. We, we were poets together at Yale. And I, I don't know why I started writing poems um, with rabbis and Hebrew and text. I have no idea. And I've tried to stop sometimes, but it was impossible. I can't really explain that. Um, and um, it's not in my control even. But um, so maybe this poem touches in on that a little bit, what, what, the, what the fascination is. So it's called The Illustrated Book of God. I opened The Illustrated Book of God. It was written all of gold letters. There was a fire on page one. The flames licked the page. I stopped reading with my eyes and read with my tongue. I tasted vermilion. I put my ear to the page and heard the lion's roar. I heard the clouds. I touched the bleak thorns of the acacia. I marched on oceans. My feet grew weary. I sank into the delicious black mud with bare feet and bare bottom. I opened the door to the stranger who lit candles in the sun. I walked on the moon. I knew strange love of every kind. Nothing was forbidden. I knew what other men thought they knew. The father came to me and blessed my broken mind. He comforted the mother who had lost her child. He sang of the shepherd and the shape. My body disappeared and I walked into pages. The gold letters left imprint on my subtle body. I knew and knew the end and the beginning. I tasted the water of loving kindness and drank a fill. The peacocks led me to the horizon. The elephants recited their Bible. The lions returned and ate my heart. I died in the dark of my last page. The book went on, still unopened, still unknown, its hand beyond knowing. So I guess while we're on the subject, um, so one time I had a dream, uh, you know, if you are friendly with the people you lose uh, and you make the effort, they come back in your dreams and you can kind of continue the relationship. At least that's that's been my experience. And and sometimes they change, too, because, you know, dying is a big deal and you're going to change, too. But um, one time I was a little uh, disconsolate, a little worn down. And um, I had a dream and Reb Zalman came to me and said, Roger, you have pages and pages in you which I thought was really sweet. Um, and um, so this poem is written um, with that title, The Pages and Pages. Again, it's about a book, and it's dedicated to uh, my friend, uh, uh, Rabbi Ozer Bergman, who taught me a little bit about Breslov Hasidism and who right now is in Uman, um, getting ready for the Rosh Hashanah of Reb Nachman, and even in the war. Uh, in Ukraine. So extraordinary that he told me hundreds of people have already shown up there. So the pages and pages for, for Rabbi Ozer Bergman. 
I opened the book, I closed the book. For every after, the words would speak. I opened the book and saw a brilliant light cresting mountains to the east, rushing towards me. Behind a congregation of shadows, a midnight robe. I slept on the book. I slept in the book. I carried it with me to school and ate it for lunch. It was my life in all the sad days, my life of broken skies and crowns of trees scraping clouds. I wrote in the book. The book wrote in me. I held the book. The book held me. I slept and the book dreamed. When I opened it again, the words were the same and changed. I read myself in the book and found my world with its roses and enemies, its pink roses and green calluses closed around buds. I opened the book in me, and who will close the book on me? Who will close my eyes? Outside the cemetery, they bury the damaged scroll, the letters torn apart, and walking out of their words. So just to say it or explain that uh, the, the Torah scrolls or, or anything with the name of God is seen as so sacred that you can't just sort of toss them in the trash and they're actually buried. And so that actually happens. Um, although it sounds, sounds like a poem, at least to me. So I want to read a, a poem for, for Moira. It's called Lemonade for My Beloved. And, um, Only God, they say, is all seeing. I must be some seeing. For I see you on a brick patio sipping lemonade in the sun. There's weather out there that hasn't arrived. The clouds are puffy pillows slumbering in midair. Midnight will come and you will close your eyes, your tongue remembering lemonade. One last sip from memory, then hail. I see some, don't see all. Where's the sun if not inside the lemon? The hail makes tiny fists that beat against the glass. There's a rhythm I can't grasp. I know almost nothing. I turn to touch you in the dark where all seeing sees, then lay back on the pillow's puffy cloud. It rains inside my mind all night. So I'm going to read um, three more. I hate when poets say that. I'm going to read 500 more poems. I'm going to read a little short poem I wrote called The Iliad. Um, but anyway, I, I'm going to read three. Um, and. Um, Two of them are of some length, but the first one actually dates back to June 1986 when we were in Israel and for the first time I visited Sfat or Sfat, Safed, depending on who's doing the geography. Um, and um, it's, it's the site of um, the grave, the tomb of um, Shimon Bar Yochai, who's said to have written the Zohar. Um, and it's a, it's a pretty holy place because it was also where uh, one of the greatest mystics of all time for Jews, uh, Rabbi um, 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 the Ari, um, right? So, um, uh, and um, for a time there um, in the 16th century, um, it was quite the center. So, um, when we got there on a Shabbat evening, early, you know, late Friday afternoon, everything was closed. We had nowhere to eat. I went wandering around and ended up uh, with some breast lovers who were praying, davening, and wearing the first strimals. And one of them took took pity on me and took me around, although he didn't speak. He only spoke Yiddish. So um, he appears in here. His name is Shimshon. I think that's all you really need to know. Strange to be a strange Jew here in Sfat. I can read the Hebrew, but not the tone. 
Though Shimshon led me here, his prayer is oddly nonchalant like business on the phone. His arching sing-song raises echoing rounds of broken mumbling, an earnest flood of Hebrew letters cracked to empty sounds, and in their midst, as if I understood, I stand and sit, a robot Jew. I lift my eyes, just as two birds enter above, late worshipers. Like me, these chimney swifts are mute. Whatever they are thinking of, it seems the bird equivalent of prayer. Three great circles in the synagogue air. Alone among these men, I stand for Kaddish, but less alone in the company of birds. O oh, great and hallowed and wonderful God, I mock, who listens to a prayer of words mumbled in confusion or blurted out. Their prayer has wings, and if brought here by chance, they teach me too much faith can shake your doubt. If pain or beauty come by circumstance, the only God is probability. The swifts smooth a tangent and one by one head for the open window, leaving me behind. I get their view of the setting sun to contemplate. Odd miracles make me wary. Diminishments a private sanctuary. I follow Shimshon out the door, my sad-eyed Jewish Virgil. I bring my own hell, a year since God played Job with me. In Sfat, one doesn't say God's name. That's just as well. His darkest name is Accident, who takes a child from mother's arms in father's sight. No peace since then, no Sabbath bride. What breaks in pieces can't be touched by prayer tonight. I look to the hills, whence cometh my help, as Shimshon shows me down the stairs. The light dies quietly, a rosy mist that heaped itself around Mount Canaan slowly fades from sight. And Mount Maron shows me a darker grace, a white tomb crumbles in that holy place. Everything gets ruined once in a while. That's a faith you can depend on to weep. What's taken's gone and won't come back. The style of grief may change, but the content will keep. We carve on a stone a hand and a name, a hand to point out, a name to remember, a boy who never opened eye, or the fame of Bar Yochai, who wrote the Book of Splendor. The sun is down, two stars show Sabbath is near. Yet Shimshon stays for Mount Maron. Is no beautiful? Yes, I think that much is clear. We lack a common language, yet we know. He hurries off to pray. I hold my peace. When any's to be had, I hold my peace. I have to say, I, not, I wrote that poem in 1986, and I don't think I've read it out loud all these years since, so thank you for being here for that. Um, I'm going to read one longish poem and then a shortish poem, and then we'll have time for questions. Um, unless I've gone too long already, I don't know. Maybe I have. Ari, or, is it okay? <laughs> We're good. Okay. We're good. We're good. Okay. So uh, this poem is uh, called Turkey Talk for Reb Nachman, Nachman of Bratislav, who was the great grandson of the Baal Shem Tov, who I mentioned earlier. Um, and uh, he died. He's known mainly for his tales in which he enclosed these. Um, uh, his, it's like a burglar's bag of jewels. There's so much Kabbalistic teaching embedded in every word of these tales. Um, and um, um, he said of the first one, you couldn't hear it without thinking of redemption. He died uh, at age um, 38, and that's what occasioned me to, he asked his disciples to burn his books, and um, his disciple did burn his books, whereas Kafka, who also died around that same time, and asked 
Max Broad to burn his books, uh, Max Broad quite wisely ignored him. So I, I wrote a book, uh, sort of dual biography of the two of them uh, called Burn Books. So um, this poem references um, uh, a tale that Rebbe Nachman told about a man, a, a prince who went mad and went under the king's table and took his clothes off and became a turkey, he thought he was a turkey, and he went around picking up the crumbs and bones underneath the table and no one could cure him until a wise man said he could do it. And of course, in the poem, I'll try to touch into how he did that. But for me, it's a it's a, a beautiful tale about uh, so much um, about the fact that in order to uh, a teacher could be very high, but in order to reach people, they have to go down to where people really are and lift them up and. And also, even if you're a therapist, like the idea that you have to meet the people where they are and gradually bring them up. So, so it's a very beautiful tale in any case. And this poem is addressed to Reb Nachman. Um, so it's called Turkey Talk for Reb Nachman. You who heard angels singing in the grass, prayers in the daffodils, do you hear between the rusted hinges of closing gates Sad thumps of engines losing heart, my little prayer. I'm down here under the table, playing with crumbs and bones in the gleam destruction leaves behind. As no Kabbalist ever said, you can lick the oil from a broken shard, but don't cut your tongue. The gleaming oil, the light behind your stories, just words? Reb Nachman, look at me now. I'm trying to dance. Even from heaven, where you study all day with the sages, it must be amusing to see my bony knees knocking, my knobby ankles shining thin skin. It's a kind of dance we make here when we tremble or shiver. It's also a dance when I make stupid jokes for the way things are, as if I were the king who set the table when you know, and I know it isn't that way, never was. Just feels so good to think we make our world. You danced in breast love to bring down the czar, but I'm trying to bring down your look into my eyes, your voice whispering and your beard scratching my earlobe. Forgive also my terrible Hebrew with its broken pieces. You who look at the holy letters without their disguises, who see them naked with their endearments as the infinite sees them parade in the days before days, or so the stories say the stories say. Sad prayers, cough up scraggly letters, stick on the larynx, twist their way through a burning throat, parched no matter how much we drink. The fruit we stole from the tree doesn't nourish us at all. I'm bone and skin, Reb Nachman, skin and bone. Every voice is a broken radio mixing static with holy light. Now I'm not dancing anymore, just twitching, spattering words and slobber, a poor equivalent of a human being who dresses to disguise his sadness, which is always out of fashion. So tell me, Reb Nachman, you too, who will always be out of fashion until stars fall out of the sky with all our eyes. What clothes can I wear for my mumbling? And how can you spare me from slipping on glistening crumbs and bones of the meal that falls from on high? Can you turn my turkey talk back to human? Reassemble torn stems into a bouquet of coronas? You who gathered handfuls of stinkweed on your long walks, exhorting yourself out of despair and into God, striking and striking your chest with bigger and bigger fists until you crack the millstone around your heart. I know any place I've been, you've been a hundred times before. Whatever I've felt, you've known with pain complete and unabridged. You wrote it down in a secret book written to save the world, but ordered your simplest chassid to burn it in the stove. Pages rose one by one, puckered, black, nearly flat, canceled souls. And yes, as you taught, I am asleep in the second degree, asleep in my sleeping. Unaware, I am unaware of the mighty light 
that throttled your body and now shines in your mind, breaks it into a thousand syllables like flower tongues and radiant flower heads, there in heaven's heaven where there are no flowers. But when you look down at daisy head and black hearted poppy on the czar's earth, lily and primrose and sullen mullein, green towers of weeds that poked into the air, shaggy sumac swaying in a breeze you could not touch, all invisibility is a lesson from world to soul. You picked flowers as letters for your enormous prayers that shook with conviction and inhuman voice. You only stopped praying when you heard your own voice speaking to itself. Reb Nachman, that's me down here crying inside as you suggested, shouting and screaming with my head on the pillow though no one can hear me, not even the dear one who lies beside me who snores quietly like a lady. Though I'm banging the back of my head against the wall and shouting behind my teeth, my head is still. I'm hardly moving. There's a dream behind my eyes that won't be seen. I hear nothing. Not even silence answers me because no wall is thick enough to mute the noise in my mind. If I ran to the ocean to scream at the waves, a kid with a plastic shovel would look up a maze from a sandcastle. If I shouted in the storm like a Yiddish a King Lear, sawing my arms like the bad actor I am, I'd probably get arrested for indecency and blasphemy and dosed for all my crying with tear gas and Prozac. They say you too were crazy with sadness, that you tumbled a thousand years from truth into a pit, sat disconsolate and refused to teach until a small light illuminated your thin face and you said with your searing pride, all my teachings are high, but my I don't know is higher than all my teachings. In a dream, all your followers left you and many did. You were so hard on them and made them confess sins to your face and wept for them harder than they wept for themselves. And when they complained that your followers were meshuggahs dancing in the marketplace on that day we Jews call happiness in the Torah, you answered, I love the old time Hasidim who stormed the palace of the king with grease still on their sleeves. Here I sit in my dull impiety, my common sense, which is every day insanity masquerading in plainness and plain sight, hungry for crumbs, Crumbs of success, crumbs of money, lying on my deathbed reciting my resume, crumbs of opinion, crumbs of desire mixed with grief and shame, like the poor schlep who stood glum at the edge of the dancing circle, until you, Reb Nachman, reached out and grabbed him by both palms, lifted him and his sins back to their long-lost love, their root in God. There is no ground now where flowers can't grow in spite of the darkness of fields where broken bodies lay after their heads were broken and human tongues went lifeless against tongues of the wart and prickly burrs when they lay mute in fields outside Breslov and Nemirov and Kamenets in fields where you once gathered prayers. But if God can make a new world from darkness, surely you, Reb Nachman, can raise a spark, no matter how far buried you are in the earth or heaven is buried in the mind. And I'm still dancing with clumsy throbs and aches because you said the greatest sin was despair. Though how you love despair, more than I do even, even more than anyone can imagine, for despair, you gathered your Hasidim around you, and for despair, you abandoned them for the Holy Land, then came back, though ships were wrecked and others drowned. For despair, you said you were the Messiah and believed it three whole years, sent out secret agents on horseback to spread the word and publish the news. Then after your baby son died, you told your stories night after night. Your first tale, though your heart was completely broken, all to rectify despair. Your first tale was the lost princess, and you said whoever heard it would try to find her and could not help but think of redemption. 
and no one got redeemed, but still you told it and invited despair to listen. So Rabbi Nachman, I'm asking you, is it true or just another story you told that when you saw a naked man gobbling under the table, a prince, son of the king, who pecked at scraps and crumbs, you tore your clothes off instantly and sat with him a long time in silence until they asked you who you were. You said, who are you? And he said, I am a turkey. Is it true you turned your face to him, your whole head full of Torah, your sad brown eyes with the heavy lashes, you who know exactly how long the journey is from under the table, how hard to return? Did you say, yes, I am a turkey too? So you slowly healed him, or he healed you, or did you, did he? Is there ever healing in a world always breaking? Is there a wise man who heals? Is there even a table? And is there really a king? This is the sad prayer coughed up my throat, my turkey gobble. But can you make any sense of belief that doesn't believe? Or why else do I talk to you inside my mind? Okay, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. And see if there's some, gosh, there's lots of questions. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, a um, lot, lot more comments, I would say, than questions. People really enjoying the poetry. So here's a few questions Good. in our, our limited time. I, I, I have them down as... Uh, um, Poetry and dreaming, poetry and prose, poetry and prayer, and then who is the missing Jew? So let's talk about dreaming. It's a big thing for you. And I have a good friend online named Noah who likes to, who was really into lucid dreaming. I also have right. another friend um, named Rochelle who is a poet, and she tells me that she dreams her poetry, wakes up in the morning and just writes it out. I want Wonderful. to know the connection between dreaming and poetry for you. And um, mm. right. if there is one. Like, I mean, do you dream your of poems? Do, do they come to you? Do the ideas of your, I mean, how, how does, how, you know, talk about that connection between dreaming uh, and your dreaming experience and your poetry. Mm. Well, it's, it's a, as we say, a Megillah. I mean, it's a long scroll. Uh, and I think uh, my fellow poet dreamer probably could verify that. Um, but I don't know. I mean, originally at the time when, um, I started writing poetry. I was a teenager, 15, and when I went to college and met all these wonderful poets who, um, including Alan Bernheim, or Sir Kip Robinson, and a number of others, um, we were hanging out. But um, I thought, gee, I'll start writing down my dreams and I'll make poems out of them. And the dreams got really scary. And actually, they got lucid, which was very scary to me. And um, I was so terrified I stopped doing that. But years later, um, um, I started thinking about it a lot. And of course, wrote the history of last night's dream. And now I work with people's dreams for the last you know, 15, 18 years. Um, all that is long-winded to say that when, oh, there's a number of things to say. Not, first of all, sometimes poems do appear intact in dreams. I think the most famous example is probably Kublai Khan. But I think um, lines, um, I've just written an essay about this, about um, a poem that appeared intact in a dream. Unfortunately, I lacked Coleridge's memory and I could only remember one line, but I tried to make a poem out of that. So there is that, there's a passive, you know, there's what we call primary imagination if you're a romantic, which is the passive experience of imagination that we all share. Each of us dreams, and even when we're awake, that. If, if you allow, if you shut out the world for a moment, close your eyes, images begin to appear. And uh, we're always producing them. So imagination in a core sense is producing images. Um, and this is an amazing reality that we dismiss. It's, it's so important to me that no matter what else is going on, no matter what's in the news, what's upsetting me, I have this process going on in me, this ongoing process of producing images. And because I'm a poet, you know, it just so happens that the way I um, 
can respond to that experience in primary imagination, whether awake or asleep, experiences of awe, experiences of terror, experiences of love, experiences of pain that are really intensely imagined. Um, I can do that. I, I practice poetry enough that I can do it in poetry. Other people can do it in painting or in scholarship or in just bringing love into their lives or being creative in any other way. It, it's just, it's in all of us, okay? It's nothing special about it, except that for a poet, it it will manifest sometimes as actual poems or very terse statements that are poetic. Like, um, you know, well, the one I cited at the beginning, you know, don't be afraid to make everything you say a prayer. That's, that's kind of a lightning bolt coming out of nowhere um, that you have to feel into. So, yeah, that's... That's a garbled. I'm writing a book about it. So when I finish the book, I'll have a more articulate answer. Okay. Do you, so when you do your poems, I mean, there are some artists, fame like Leonard Cohen took forever to write his poetry and, or his music because he would change words all the time. Do you yeah. write it out and it's a completed poem if it's a short poem, or do you spend a lot of time rewriting, rewriting to get the perfect words for yourself? I guess that different artists and different Writers have different approaches. I'm interested in your approach. Well, there isn't any one approach. I mean, the, the, like a, this book is 46 years worth of approaches from, I mean, even in the poems that I read, some are in iambic pentameter and rhymed, and some of them are prose poems and everything in between. So um, um, different approaches. But um, I would say that um, when I reflect on where it all began, there's a kind of... Um, impulse to write i think poets know what i'm talking about there's just a it's it's not verbal necessarily but it's just this feeling of poems coming and you run to start making it and um then over years and time you you develop a, a sense of what makes it a good poem and i find i can fairly quickly cut the crap i usually do that right after i've written something then i let it sit for a while and then i come back and work on it some poems um um come rather quickly and some take a long, long time. So it just depends on the work. Um, I don't know how long it took me to write that long Nachman poem, but I, I'm sure, I assure you it wasn't at one sitting, mm. uh, but um, sometimes it happens that way too. There was a question about whether you have other skills in art. Do you, are you skilled in visual art as well? Do you paint? Do you draw? No, nope. no, I don't. Um, I like to take pictures of bugs um, and I guess I'm, I don't always put my thumb on the camera, so I guess I'm fairly good. But um, I, um, Moira is a novelist and a painter, so she's she's got that bailiwick, and uh, and she's she's really good. So I would be ashamed to do anything, but I can't. No, I don't do that. So I want to talk about your relationship between your prose and your poetry because I've read the prose, the the, um, uh, the books that you that you published, uh, many of them, and. Um, you know, um, how do you how do you toggle in between the two, or do you toggle in between the two? Are they separate projects in your mind, or do they? How do they interplay the poetry and the prose? Mm. Yeah, um, I think poetry was the first love, and um, I just felt that. What I was learning in poetry, there were some things. I, I first turned to prose in part um, just to, just because it was fun to write op-eds for the Baltimore Sun and get on the bus and see people open the newspaper and they were all reading it at once. That was kind of thrilling, especially for a poet, because poets are pretty much neglected. So I guess I did it for ego satisfaction and I got fairly good at it. And then when my mother died and I wrote a book called Terra Inferma, for whatever reason, I felt that it would be better to write it in prose because there were medical things in there. It was about her dying, and and this was a long time ago, 19, um, 1980, 81. And um, so I wrote it in prose, um, although it took me so long to write, and I realized actually I was writing in verse in prose, but didn't know that. So I could have written, divided it into lines, but I, I didn't do that. So... Um, but obviously, when you're talking about something like the Joy of the Lotus, it, it, it was a poet's point of view, but it was written in prose. 
the subtitle is a poet's something's account of Jewish Buddhist dialogue or something like that. And um, that's true. So a friend of mine, David Rosenberg, said that, you know, in our society, you have to smuggle in poetry because the word poetry, as soon as you say the word poetry, most people are like, ah, you know, get away. I don't want to hear that. So though all of you are living proof, that's not true. So thank you. But but generally speaking, you can smuggle in poetry into prose. So I, I think the genre thing is a little bit um, overbaked. Hmm. Um, I want to talk about poetry and prayer. Yes. Because there's some quotes. I mean, in our prayer, in a traditional siddur, there is poetry. I mean, we say poems so um, as part of the prayer, but I think you distinguish between the two. I want you to, I want to get your thoughts on poetry and prayer. Well, we have a form, you know, one of the questions that I guess I would ask myself is what are, what are, and you can do, when I first started writing Jewish poems, you know, there was a poet, Meyer Sklaru, who said, what is a Jewish poem? Does it, does it, does it wear a yarmulke or something? You know, what is a Jewish poem? You know, what does that even mean? So um, you can have, and then shortly after I began doing what I did, then there were a whole bunch of these poems being written and they all had, you know, Jewish accoutrement, you know, and I was curious about what an inner sense would be of a Jewish poem. So one sense I had was it involves midrash, involves a text that organically grows from another text. And I think that's essentially, uh, I'm sure it's found in other cultures, but it's definitely strong in, in, in Hebrew culture and Jewish culture. And then there's a the psalm. So the psalm is a prayer. It's a poem addressed to God. So I think some of the poems I read have that quality, and um, um, therefore they 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 are prayers. Um, but what is God? I don't know. But anytime you're addressing your poems to uh, to that um, in direct address, you know, I use the word "you" a lot. Then then you know that's my favorite name of God, you. So when you, because that way it can be read lots of ways too, but but then you're writing, um, you're in the psalmic tradition, I think. My wife, who is a cantor, does not like uh -oh. to listen to her her earlier work uh -huh. because she's advanced and she feels that her craft is now at this point, whereas it was that point. You've now collected a book of poems from 1976, 2022. Do you look back at your early poetry and feel similar or do you feel your um i mean your, your poems are from a very different time in your life and you probably had different writing skills so i mean I, I take it you don't go back and change the poems but maybe you do the early ones you probably i assume keep them intact and therefore um want to know how that feels to you to look back at the i, I made a few changes uh but i won't divulge them but ah. i'll leave that to people who care uh but but i would say that um um yeah, generally, I, I I wanted to leave it as a document and a record, and without I'm not that concerned about. I mean, yeah, the poems I was writing when I was 26, and the concerns I had then, and the concerns I have now, are different. But I, it feels like in the back of the book I have a little essay about it, so it feels like it's still all me. It all still sounds like me to me. I don't know how it sounded to you all. I read poems from 70s, 80s. You have to tell me. I don't, you're the audience. You tell me what it sounds like. I don't. I don't know for sure. But it, to me, it seemed. Um, um, it sounded familiar. <laughs> yeah. So I wanted to go back to the title, "The Missing Jew." Okay. Um, what, what's the an what was the answer from other? People? I don't know. I, I only got one person, so I'm asking people who is the missing Jew, um, mm -hmm. and right. but, um, but I must, I, you know. I'd like to know what the audience says, but I also want to ask you because you chose the. I assume you chose the. title. Did you choose the title, or did, did your did some, the editor choose the title? I guess that's no, no. I, I chose the title. And it, I think I wrote a poem about it later when I did the second edition called "The Missing Jew." So there's sort of a poetic answer to that question if you if you read the book um, and have time to find that poem, which I think is just simply called "The Missing Jew," but because um, he was asking that too, so I I thought I quiet him down by writing that poem um you know um the jew uh, i thought that joshua weiner and his little um uh, endorsement that he wrote kind of 
defined it nicely. So I, I would refer you to his statement. But but my sense of of it is so um, hmm. I mean, I think it could mean several things. You know, it could mean um, the Jew that's missing from history, the Jew that's, you know, because of what happened, um, all the Jews missing from history, the, the Jew missing in me as I um, navigate a, a life that's um, secular and not, not, not pious. Um, um, the sense of the poet as as actually not you know until fairly recently Jewish poets were kind of outside the scope of the Jewish community. I mean, I, by the way, I thank you for inviting a poet to to come to this because usually it's rare actually you know for poets to be included in the in the conversation. So maybe that's another sense of it. But uh, I don't want to limit it because other people have better ideas probably. Well, now all of a sudden I'm getting some good stuff about the missing of course Jews. so um you prompted a discussion um there was a question and i and someone said if they've never read roger kamenitz's poems or poetry before what what book should they read first now i would say get the missing jew <laughs> because that's going to have a lot of your poetry but yes um, i agree <laughs> yeah so um i'm going to post know. a link right now and you can oh. okay okay i posted one at the beginning but you know feel free to post oh one. i'm and sorry will, that's not it that's not it no, I, no. I will share um, I will share your your link as well in a follow up to this. Um, okay, cool. Okay, well, I think we uh, we've gone over time. I don't. Uh, I mean, there's more we could do. People have questions about the uh, the, the whole Ju Judaism and Buddhism, and if that's something you're still interested um, involved with. Um, is also a question about what you do with the dream. You know, what is your what is this. Um, program a project that you work on with people on their dreams maybe we can get okay to those well i'm gonna i'm gonna post a link uh both to my website and naturaldream.com um you can find out more about it but basically what we do is we we treat dreams as not to as interpretation but rather as events or experiences that are taken seriously and we look for the moments of sacred encounter in the dreams and those moments of sacred encounter, there are powerful feelings, and those feelings um, can help us move past um, our reactivity and go deeper into who we are. But how are you? And then, I mean, I assume many people have this problem. How do you? How are you supposed to remember your dreams so you can sit down with you discuss them? Because most of us barely remember them. I think once you start having a use for your dreams in the conversation that you're having with the practitioner um uh you start remembering them better and also we ask people to do homework where they take a moment from the dream and remember it and that usually stimulates uh, more dreams so um uh it, it's a process but by once someone does some sessions and they realize oh wow wow i didn't know that about me and i didn't know i i never felt that before then then they dreams start coming up stronger for them mm. so and ending on um the jew and lotus so judaism and buddhism is that still something that you are interested in working on writing about um i'm working on some project around it but but I, i'm not um yeah and i teach i mean i i, I taught last year on dreams you know, to a buddhist community online uh, actually in southern santa barbara and um I am um, still engaged and occasionally I um, do sitting meditation myself and try to investigate that. But um, so, yeah, it's in my life and I know so many wonderful people um, involved with that more, more directly than I am. Mm, thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. The Missing Jew poems, 1976, 2022. Uh, when are you coming out with the next iteration of this book? <laughs> Uh, well, sometime before 120 years old, I guess. Was, I don't know. <laughs> it's not up to me, my brother. <laughs> okay. Well, we, I keep, I got lots of people who want you to come back and do more programs for CSP online. So we'll talk about that. I want okay. to thank the audience for being with us today. It is uh, Elul. Um, Rosh Hashanah is coming up. This is a great program. 
very thoughtful program. And I think um, reading the poetry and many of the poems you share with us are, are reflexive, thoughtful, um, great for Elul. So I urge you all to enjoy the poetry of Roger Kamenetz. I thank you all for joining us. If you're new to CSP, check us out, occsp.net. And our goal is to bring an incredible variety of really interesting people to, to our online community. So Alexis just showed some books she had. I don't know what it was. Maybe it's the new book. Is that the book? Hard to see. Oh, uh, yeah. She's got the book. Thank you, Alexis. Yeah, <laughs> the book. Uh, oh, it's blurry. Anyway. Anyway, you know, I, I get in trouble whenever I say this, but I, some, you know, some of you may belong to synagogues where the services go very long or don't necessarily go to services for the holidays. But I always find it's good to bring a book with you <laughs> just during the parts that may uh, may not be as interesting. Just don't sit in the front row with your book or put it behind the seat door and maybe bring the poetry book with you this year and read it and think. Um, I'll read it during the breaks if if you, if you um, take the breaks sure. during the services. But Roger's nice seeing you. You were some I don't know if uh, Tamar Brow remembers, but you were here in our community many years ago uh, for one of your books. I think you gave at least one lecture, if not more. So um, it's been probably over 10, 12 years. Nice to nice to see you again nice and nice you. to meet all these new people. Take care, everybody. Right. Be safe and um, see you at a future CSP event. Thanks. Thank to you. All. Thank you. all. Thank you. And not to everybody. Have, have a great and sweet right. and healthy new year. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. And so Richard much. Michelson. I'll email you. Nice to see you. Bye. Well.